Would you join with me in prayer, please? Father God, we come to you this morning grateful for the gift of this day and grateful for the opportunity that it allows us to gather together, both in person and on Zoom, come together as a community of faith to offer to you our worship as a God who is worthy of that worship. Father, we are grateful for your goodness. We are grateful for your love. We are grateful for the hope and peace that you provide for each and every one of us. Father, as we gather together this morning, my prayer are for those who are hurting. Father, there are those that are hurting physically. There are those that are hurting emotionally those that may be struggling economically and relationally. Maybe those who are hurting spiritually. And Father, my prayer would be that as we worship you this morning, that we would allow your spirit to speak to each and every one of us at the very point of need that we have in our lives. Father, that we might draw upon your power and your strength and your courage to live lives of faith that are pleasing to you and that serve as an example to those that we encounter. Father, I pray that you would bless our time together this morning and that the worship we offer would be pleasing. It's a prayer we offer in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, 
and our friend. Amen. Those of you who are here, you may be seated. Ellis, you want to put a microphone over here? There's one down here. Never, bother, never mind Ellis. He's just doing what Ellis does. Oh, okay. Obviously, you're not as loud as you thought you were, huh? People at home are going, I think they're singing, but words are on our screen, but we can't hear anybody. So I want to take just a moment and say welcome. We are delighted that you are here, that you have chosen to come and to worship with us this Sunday, the final Sunday of January. It's hard to believe we're already a month in uh, to 2021. But as they say, time flies when you're having fun. And uh, I don't know that we've ever had more fun than we have in the past year. Uh, but nevertheless, we're delighted that you are here, uh, either in person or via Zoom. Uh, I have a couple of announcements that we need to share. Is Stephen, is Diane here still here? There she is. Okay, I see her. I'm going to share one announcement, and then we're going to watch a video, and Diane's going to share the second announcement. Uh, 2020 has been a very difficult year, I don't have to tell you. And uh, for us as a community of faith, it has also been a very difficult time in that much of what we wanted to do, we were unable to do. And uh, much of what we would like to have done, uh, we were unable to get done. But we have a group of ladies in the life of this church who, while they could not gather together, continued to take their talents and use their gifts to minister to other people. I'm speaking of our quilting group. Uh, we have a quilting group that typically meets together on Tuesday. They uh, have refreshments, and they sit around, and they, uh, they make quilts. And uh, on December of 2020, uh, this group, all, each of them working from home, uh, delivered quilts. Uh, we had one baby quilt that was given to a member of our church family. Uh, they also uh, donated uh, two baby quilts to a couple of moms who were in our mops group. They donated nine quilts to Synergy House. There were six twin size quilts and three youth size quilts. They also donated nine quilts to Ronald McDonald House, four queen size quilts, two full size quilts, and three baby quilts. What I'm saying is that while we have been in the midst of this pandemic, these ladies have continued to find ways to minister using their gifts and their talents. And they ended up donating 21 quilts during 2020. And uh, yeah, they, they need that. Uh, they are very committed to what they do. And uh, when the service is over out in the four-year area, they have got several of the quilts uh, that they have made that they've not yet donated anywhere uh, on display out there. So if you would, take, simply take a moment and look them over. Um, you'll see the work that they do. Uh, Stephen, are we ready? Let's do a video, and then Diane is going to come and share with us an announcement related to the video. It's hard for me to not be optimistic. It's part of the way I'm made. I believe that it's possible for us to come together. I believe it's possible for us to, to make changes that could change the world. I have naively believed that from the beginning, and yet it's not naive because I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen through you. I've seen communities change. I've seen neighborhoods change. I've seen college campuses change because of you and your places. And, and this is what I still believe can change the world. I still believe you and your places, loving your people, doing simple things well can change the world. But it's scary and it's confusing and it's divided and it feels darker than it's ever felt before. But that hope is still true. And even if we lose everything, 
even if our our hopes are completely deferred, even if the very worst happens, even if there is a God that has a plan for the even if. There is a God that has a plan for you in the midst of this chaos. He doesn't leave us in the dark. He, he in fact, promises us that there is a hope that is going to make all of this seem small. And there have been times in my life that I have needed to be reminded of that hope. But I don't know that there's ever been a time in any of our lives that the entire world has needed to be reminded of that hope. So even if, even if everything in this world falls apart, which it feels like it is, our God is secure and our hope is sure. And I believe that we are going to get to give that hope away this year in bigger ways than we could imagine. One weekend, thousands and thousands and thousands of you gathering together with one purpose, to come before God and to ask the question, how do you want us to live? Guys, this is the story of If Gathering. Women from all different backgrounds, women from all different countries, women from all different races and, and ages. And guys, we need this more than ever. We want you to bring your people together in your places, wherever you feel safe, however that, that looks for you this March. We want you to bring your people together on mission, praying and asking God, how do we lead out of this? Do not miss this. Join us live, gather your people, tell everybody you know, and let's go and imagine a world that is unified again and on mission for the glory of God. No, you can. Uh, I'm so excited to be able to offer this conference at our church that we're going to bring it to you guys. It is a virtual conference. It'll be Friday night and Saturday. It's open to uh, women ages 14 and above. Let me turn this on. This one's on? This one's on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, so the conference is Friday night and Saturday, March 5th and 6th for ages 14 and above women. It is open to anybody that would like to come. We are going to do all of the COVID protocols that we have in place now to make sure that everybody is safe. There will, everybody will wear masks, be social distance, that sort of thing. Uh, because it is a virtual conference, meaning that we will watch it on the screen if you are not comfortable being in person, you can watch it virtually from your home. You could gather a couple of ladies that you do hang out with and that's in your bubble and that you feel secure being around in your home together, or you could do it by yourself, or you could come in person. There obviously is some benefits of doing it with another person because there is some compensation cards and breakouts where you will have discussions so that we can talk about how to apply these concepts to our life. Because ladies, it's been tough to be on purpose. This last year, we've been quarantined, stuck inside. The, way that, the ways that we've been able to be out in the world, being a light for Jesus, have been shut down. And it is time for us to be re-energized, to think outside the box, because if there was ever a time in the world that needed God's light, it is right now. And that is our job. And our, my hope is that this will encourage us to move forward. And I love hearing about the Quilting Club and how they have thought outside the box and how they've been able to continue to share God's light. And the world needs more of that. So it, it is Friday night and Saturday. Um, if you are in person, then we will have a box lunch. It's 100% free. Because of our relationship with Right Now Media and that the church has signed up with that, we get to show the conference for free. And the church will be providing box lunches um, to feed us in a very safe way as well during the day on Saturday. Um, it is going to be, we have flyers for you. At the end of the service, Stephen or someone will be at the back handing out information that has links where you can get additional information. It'll be all over our social media. Um, Patty has been manning our social media really well lately and has put a lot of stuff out there. She'll be flooding the social media with it. So there'll be links as to how you can get more information and get signed up online. 
if you're not computer savvy and that's not your thing, there is a bottom of the flyer, there's a place that you can fill out and turn in and we'll sign up for you. So uh, you might ask why on earth I'm carrying this bucket up here. If you can imagine March 5th and 6th, just right around the corner. So we have just barely over a month to get this planned. And so we are offering an incentive for early registration. So if you sign up this week, we have a Super Bowl bucket for you. Anybody that signs up this week will be in the drawing for the, there's snacks, there's a great Kansas City Chiefs tumbler and a gift certificate for a Chief shirt. Now, some of you may know Michael Zeller, who is a youth that grew up in our church and she now has a little small business where she makes things like this and she made this tumbler and will provide the shirt for you as well so that you can have a complete Super Bowl package for you the day of um, Super Bowl. So this will be given away for next week for anybody who signs up this week's name will go in the drawing. Um, if you have any questions, my contact information is on the flyer as well as will be online. And just let me know if I can help. We'd love to see you there. Our next hymn is Victory in Jesus.
Sorry for that. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. Freely forever One day he's coming Oh glorious day Glorious day One day they led him Up Calvary's mountain one day they nailed him to die on a tree suffering anguish despised and rejected bearing our sins my redeemer is he when your nations lynched out on a tree and took the nails from me living he loved me dying he saved me Buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, glorious day. One day the grave could conceal him no longer. One day the stone rolled away from the door. Then he arose over death he had conquered. Now is ascended, my Lord, evermore. Death could not hold him. The grave could not keep him from rising again. Rising again. He loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh, glorious day. Oh, glorious day. For your coming, one day the skies of his glory will shine. Your glories will shine. Wonderful day, my beloved one bringing my Savior, my Savior Jesus, Jesus is mine. Living, he loved me, dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified. Freely forever, one day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day, glorious day.
Who knew when I dedicated her? Donna, I told Kaylin that all her years in children's choir paid off. If only her uncle had been in children's choir. It is, uh, David and Kaylin led our uh, contemporary worship this morning uh, and uh, did a great, great job. And, uh, I'm just, it's really neat be able to, uh, to hear them and to uh, see uh, how she has grown, as has David. Uh, it's really, really neat. Uh, when I was a child growing up, I can recall my mother saying from time to time, probably because of what I had done or probably because of what I had said, Something to the effect, Terry, you're about to drive me to my wit's end. Now, Mom, I know if you're listening in Oklahoma, you're going to deny that. But more than once, I heard you say it. I'm at my wit's end. How many of you have ever heard that phrase before? Is that Oh, okay, plenty of you. Good, good. I didn't know. I didn't know. Uh, the early service, I could see the young people going, wit? What wit? Wit means you're humorous. Uh, but sometimes we find ourselves, because of situations or circumstances, we find ourselves almost at our wit's end. Uh, another phrase that we may have heard from time to time or even spoken ourselves is, you know what? I'm finding myself at the end of my rope. Uh, you know, those times in life when an event or circumstances of life, or perhaps it's God himself, those times in life when we find ourselves being taken to the very edge, being taken to the brink, being taken to the end of our road, being taken to our wit's end. It's a time when things have uh, somehow conspired against us. When you suddenly find yourself needing to make a decision that can alter our future, either positively or negatively. Or maybe it's a time in the living of our lives where a persistent parade of obstacles and opportunities have confronted us with those moments that demand a decision. Ever been there? Well, if you have, you're not unlike the people in our story for this morning. Because you see, in our text, we find the nation of Israel standing at just such a place. Before them lie the promises of God. Behind them, they can't help but see the gathering clouds of dust from Pharaoh's chariots. Let's review the story. As we know the story, the Israelites are slaves in Egypt where life is being made increasingly difficult. You may have heard of an individual by the name of Moses, who also was an Israelite, but he was off tending his father-in-law's sheep, when one day he has this encounter with a burning bush. From that bush, God speaks to Moses, and he tells him, Moses, I want you to go to Egypt. I want you to tell the Pharaoh that he is to let my people go. Moses begins almost immediately offering up one excuse after another as to why he cannot go. His first excuse that he offers up is, well, who am I? 
Who am I to go and tell Pharaoh that he needs to let your people go? Well, God takes care of that excuse. Moses then says, well, let's suppose they want to know who it is that sent me. What do I tell them? God says, you tell them I am sent you. Moses says, God, I've never been a very eloquent speaker. In fact, most theologians and history books and biblical scholars will tell you he had a speech impediment of some sort. God says, don't worry about that. I'll take care of that. And finally, <laughs> Moses, out of excuses, says, the fact is, God, I just don't want to go. But he does. After offering up one excuse after another to God as to why he's not the person for that kind of job, Moses finally decides to do what God has called him to do. And so Moses, along with his spokesperson Aaron, they go to Egypt and they confront Pharaoh, and they tell him exactly what God has said. Pharaoh says, so what? He's unmoved. In fact, he begins making the Israelites work even harder. He makes their task far more difficult. And then we all know the story. For God sends these plagues upon Egypt. And following this series of plagues, Pharaoh, well, he has a change of heart. And he makes his decision to allow the Israelites to go free. Now that they're free, God doesn't lead them on a road through the Philistine country, even though that would have been far shorter you may say, well, why wouldn't he lead them on the shorter route? Well, God was concerned that if he led them through Philistine country, they might face war and the Israelites might change their minds and say, you know what, we were better off in Egypt. Let's just go back there. Instead, God led them around by the desert road toward the Red Sea, and he led them by clouds during the day and a pillar of fire at night in order that they might be able to travel constantly, both day and night. Meanwhile, back in Egypt, Pharaoh and his officials changed their mind. In fact, I can almost see Pharaoh going, what were we thinking to let them go? I mean, after all, we had free labor. He changes his mind about what he's done, and, and so Pharaoh uh, has his chariot made ready along with every other chariot and soldier in Egypt, and they begin to pursue the Israelites, overtaking them, clamp, get closing in on them as they are camped by the Red Sea. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I want us to read some verses from Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14, and then we're going to talk uh, for a little bit. Exodus chapter 14, I want us to begin reading in verse 10. Uh, the story has brought us to this point. Beginning in verse 10, the scriptures tell us that as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? I mean, didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moses answered the people, 
do not be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. So here are God's people with the Red Sea in front of them and the soldiers of Pharaoh closing in from behind. No doubt here are the people of God, the Israelites, almost at their wits' end, thinking, what have we done? Why have you brought us out here? I mean, were there no graves in Egypt? Didn't we tell you we wanted to stay in Egypt? You see, we find God's people on the brink needing to make a decision about their future. What are we going to do? How are we going to handle it? Uh, they see themselves in crisis mode, if you will. The Red Sea in front of them. Pharaoh's soldiers behind them. And so what was God's message to his people? Who find themselves at the edge. Almost at the end of their rope. What does God say to his people who are on the brink? God tells them essentially that they are to do three things. The first thing he says is fear not. Fear not. Listen, there are typically a two sources of fear. One is a fear of the past. You see, in the case of Israel, it was the chariots of Egypt bent on revenge by returning them to slavery. For us, for you and me, it's often the failures of our past which are constantly pursuing us coming back to haunt us. You see, for you and I, maybe it's the things we've done or things we haven't done. Maybe it's the things we've said or have failed to say. Whatever it might be, we all know or have known a fear of the past. I talk to people all the time. The biggest hurdle they face is the ability to let go of the past. They're scared to death of it. But you see, secondly, there is a fear of the future. And in the case of Israel, it was the uncertainty of the wilderness. It was uncertainty about what their ultimate fate might be. For you and I, it's also a case of not knowing what the future holds. The uncertainty of our relationships. It's the uncertainty over the status of our jobs and our retirement. It's the uncertainty over our health. We worry about the future of our children and our grandchildren. Indeed, we worry about the future of the world. You see, there are typically two sources of fear. One, a fear of the past. The other, a fear of the future. And the problem is that our fears have the potential to enslave us. I don't have to tell you that fear can often discourage us, if not paralyze us. 
Many of us today are not unlike um, the Israelites of old who uh, were there in that situation, that circumstance, fearful. We're not unlike them in the fact that we find ourselves often fearful on the shore of some sea that we find ourselves unable to cross. The good news, the good news is that the only strength which can dispel fear comes not from within us, but rather it comes from above us. It's the reassurance of the God of the universe who tells us, fear not. The reality is, only God can truly do away with fear. If you don't believe me, just go to the Bible, or better yet, find you a concordance. Just count the number of times that it is said in Scripture, fear not. Or be not afraid. Or as we talked about this past Wednesday, at our Wednesday conversation, uh, the writer of Romans reminds us in chapter 8, verse 31, if God be for us, who can be against us? Or as John Maxwell translates that particular verse, if God be for us, everybody else might as well be. Fear not. Fear not. The second point that he made is that we are to stand firm. You see, being on the edge or close to the edge, being on the brink, that's a pretty precarious place to stand. Um, And it's a place from which we, like Israel, would prefer to simply run. Uh, A lot of people try and run backwards, you know. Uh, Israelites, you know, we tried to tell you we'd be better off just to leave us in Egypt, even though we were living as slaves and life was tough. You see, why would they want to run backwards into Egypt? Because they wanted to retreat into the security of the past, even if that past was difficult, even if that past was harmful, even if the past wasn't what they want or isn't what they want it to be, they try and run backwards. Why? Because it is familiar. Certainly Israel entertained the idea on numerous occasions while they found themselves in the wilderness. There are those people who want to run backward. They want to run to that which is safe and familiar. But still other people choose to simply try and run away and don't run anywhere. They're trying to escape the challenges and the obstacles of life in front of them. They try to escape the challenges of of following God. They think if they can just somehow run away, they can run away to a different place, or if they can run away to a different situation, or if they can run away to a different person, that some way or somehow the obstacles or challenges that lie before them are simply going to magically disappear. Let me tell you something. Shallow belief and cheap religion are about the only things that disappear in the face of a challenge. But God's message to the people of Israel and His message to you and I is stand firm. And yet, I don't have to tell you that even in spite of God's message, our world is full of people who are simply trying to run away. Countless individuals in our world running from difficult relationships, running from difficult jobs, running from challenging situations. And I suppose the reason they run is because they often mistakenly believe that the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. You ever known anybody like that? Constantly chasing after what they think are greener pastures. 
as I've said time and again, uh, the only thing that makes them greener pastures, they're not really greener pastures, they're just better kept pastures. You know, the grass isn't always greener on the other side of the fence. Sometimes it's just better kept. Okay? But the message of Scripture is that somehow, even in the face of life's greatest challenges, faith takes a stand. Fear not. Stand firm. Know who you are. Trust in the God that you follow and serve. And resolve to yourself that you will not allow your faith to be moved. Fear not. Stand firm. And finally, he tells the Israelite people, see the deliverance of the Lord. To see the salvation of the Lord. Listen, being on edge, uh, being uh, close to the end of our rope, being on the brink, I will admit that's a fearful and uneasy place to stand. It's not always easy to find yourself sitting in those situations that are forcing you to make a decision as to how you're going to respond. But while it is a difficult and uneasy and fearful place to stand, it is nevertheless the best place to observe exactly what God can do. You see, God had brought Israel to this place for the very purpose of demonstrating his power to deliver them, to save them, to bring about their deliverance. You see, the Red Sea that lay before them, and, uh, while they saw it as the edge of disaster, the good news is it was about to become the threshold of their salvation. How often is that the case? The primary message of our text this morning, along with biblical example after example after example, is this. Our God acts in decisive ways to demonstrate that it is He and He alone that can truly say that it is he and he alone that can safely deliver you and I to the other side. For Israel, the miraculous crossing of the Red Sea, the manna, the quail, the water, all of that is evidence of that truth. Here's the thing. It's in our extremity that God finds opportunity. It is precisely when you and I are at the end of our rope, when you and I are on the edge, when you and I are at our wit's end, when you or I are on the brink that God can do and often does His greatest work. I told the group this morning, if the past 11 months have taught me anything, it's taught me I don't like pandemics. Okay, let's just be honest. I was uh, thinking this morning about the message, and I thought, you know what? 
I don't like any of this. I don't like masks. I don't like the fact that we can't all just be together. I don't like the fact that we can't do a lot of the ministries and activities and things that we done customarily. There's an awful lot about this that, quite honestly, has almost brought me to my wits in. Trying to figure out how do we do this. There have been weeks that I have thought, you know what, Harry, you're getting awful close to the end of your rope. Uh, you don't ever want to get quite to the end of your rope, but been close. The one thing the text has spoken to me this week so God is saying, listen, don't be afraid. There's a lot of things that are still uncertain with what we're facing. I mean, we, 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 we know that we now have vaccines. We just don't know if we're going to get them and when we're going to get them. You know? But what the text has taught me is, Terry, even in the midst of a pandemic, don't be afraid. Stand firm. Keep the faith. Keep on keeping on. And see the salvation of the Lord. See the deliverance of a God. A God who loves you and cares deeply about you. A God who loves all of us and cares deeply about us. Listen, as I shared in the early service, I'm, I'm, I'm quite certain the Israelites were del delighted, I mean just overjoyed, that God delivered them out of Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea. Then they wandered in the wilderness not for a year, 40 years. And I couldn't help but wonder, we're 11 months in. I pray to God it's not 40 years. You see what I'm saying? Listen, folks, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Stand firm on your faith in Jesus Christ. Firm on your faith in a God that's living and loving. And allow yourself to be there when he delivers us. Father God, we come to you this morning. And these are difficult days in which we live. Father, our patience sometimes runs really, really thin. Father, there are those times over the past 11 months when we have found ourselves at our wit's end. Those times when we found ourselves at the end of our ropes and all we're doing is just trying to hang on for dear life. Father, those times when we have come to the very edge of not knowing what to do or what not to do. And yet, Father, we come to you this morning because not necessarily because of our faithfulness to you, but because of your faithfulness to us. Help us as we continue to move forward into 2021. Help us to not be afraid, to stand firm upon our faith and your promises, and to allow you 
to deliver us on the other side. Father, my prayer this morning is that if there is someone who needs to receive your salvation through Jesus Christ, your Son, Father, that they would make that decision. But Father, for all of us, my hope is that we will pray to you to allow you to keep us from being afraid that we will recommit ourselves to standing firm on the faith we proclaim, that we will allow you to work your wisdom and your will in the living of our lives that we might come out on the other side. Father, it's a prayer we offer in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our Lord, our Savior, and our friend. Amen. Those of you who are in person, I'm going to invite you to stand. Karen's going to come and lead us in a song of response. But Jesus, come into your heart. That's my hope and my prayer for each and every one of you within the sound of my voice this morning. Those of you who are here, let's stand and sing. <laughs> me to simply say how much I appreciate and how delighted we are that you chose to worship with us this Sunday. Uh, I would simply remind you on the way out, those of you ladies that want to be entered, um, registered for the conference that will be upcoming and thereby entered to win the uh, gift that we'll be doing next Sunday, uh, you need to get registered as quickly as possible. Um, John Shadell and Brian and Skeegan had Sherry and Shannon back there signing up before we could even get out of the first service because they want the Super Bowl uh, prize that's there. So you need to do that. So pick up a registration form, ladies, as you leave. And also I remind you that our quilts are back there for you to, uh, to take a look at. With that, I simply uh, 
uh, encourage you, uh, have a great week, stay safe, and to go in the grace and peace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You're dismissed. <laughs>